the Lord be with you. We're so grateful that you are worshiping with us through our uh, online ministry. And even though I can't see you, God does. He's there with you wherever you are. And I pray that you take great comfort and are filled with joy in knowing that God is with you wherever you may be. As we go through our worship time today, we are following along with Divine Service Setting 2 from the Lutheran Service Book. If you have one of those at home, it's a great way to follow along with the way we're worshiping. And certainly, if you'd like to get a copy of that from us, borrow one from your cross family, let us know. We'll make one available for you. The hymns that we get to sing will be on the screen for you as we get to them, but there's also a list of those hymns in the description of this video. So if you'd like to, you know, put your bookmark ahead in there and be ready for certain songs when we get to them, you can do that as well. And I'd encourage you to, uh, as we continue to learn and grow together in how to best provide uh, worship at a distance opportunities for you, whether you're part of our cross family or whether you're watching from afar and maybe part of another church, or maybe you don't have a church home yet. Uh, whatever the case may be, we want to hear how this has been for you, if, if you've been worshiping with us. If there are things about the way we're doing worship these days that's really meaningful to you, let us know. Send us a direct message or a comment or, or, or contact us in the church office. And certainly if there are things that are really important to you and, and that we can help facilitate and worship with you, let us know that too. We want to be growing together, just like I said, and we want to be able to serve you in this worship ministry the best way we can. And I'll also say this now, and may say it again toward the end too, but if you'd like to serve in this ministry in some way, please let us know that too. We're always looking for extra helpers to do all sorts of different things. If you think that's a way that God can work through you to be of service to others, let us know that as well. As we dive into worship now, our, our focus, as you might have seen from a, a picture popping up on the screen, has a little bit to do with dogs. Are you a dog person? A cat person? Uh, whichever way you answer that, we won't hold it against you. But do know that in God's Word this week, Jesus talks a little bit about dogs. I hope you stick with us all the way through to the gospel reading and the sermon today to hear just how he does that. And I think as we listen to him, we will learn more and more about him and who he is to us. May he bless us abundantly as we are gathered in various places to worship him together. We sing our opening hymn now.
our God has given us his sure and certain promise that he will never, ever leave you or forsake you. He is present with you. He's present with us as we are gathered now in his name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak the words of our introit, these words of the Psalms, responsively back and forth, our voices echoing out before the throne of God. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults. And with my song, I give thanks to him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. The Lord be with you. And let us pray together the collect of the day. Lord Jesus Christ, you have promised to embrace all who repent and cry out to you for mercy. Grant that we, no matter our background or station in life, with all assurance come before you, confident that because of your sacrifice on our behalf, our Heavenly Father welcomes our prayers and petitions. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this week is from Isaiah chapter 56. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples." The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak our Alleluia verse together. Alleluia. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Alleluia. In the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Kids, I hope you're sitting close to the screen, but not too close that it hurts your eyes because I want you all to see the pictures that are coming up on the screen right now. Hopefully you see on there pictures of three dogs, each of them very special. Uh, If you were to ask Dr. Brandenberger, our principal and an organist today, which one of those three dogs is the mostest specialist dog of all, well, he'd probably point to the one in the bottom corner because that is Gatsby, a great one at that. Now, I don't know everything about what's in your home with you right now, but I wonder if maybe you have a family pet, especially if you have a family dog. Now, to help me know if you have a family dog or not, with your parents' permission and help, maybe you could send a picture of your family pet as a comment there or a direct message or send it into the office sometime this week. I would love to see a picture of your family pet. Because there's something really important and special about dogs, isn't there? Dogs are an amazing creature. They're often called man's best friend for good reason, because they love dearly. Now, one of the most important things for taking care of a dog is actually making sure that it has enough food. You wouldn't want to get way too hungry, would you? Well, neither would a dog. Dogs need to eat. And in the story that we just heard that Jesus was talking to a woman, they talked about how important it is for dogs to eat in that story. Now, they weren't just talking about dogs for dog's sake. 
but they were bringing in something that people would have understood, dogs, and that dogs need to eat. See, Jesus told this woman that she was kind of like a dog, that she wasn't quite uh, having a place at the table for the meal. Now, I don't know how it works in your family, but in most families, when it's dinner time, parents have a seat at the table, kids have a seat at the table, and usually there's not a doggy chair at the table. That would be pretty silly. But if that's how your family does it, that's okay. Let's talk about that later. That's fine. But usually, the place for a dog is not right at the table. And and if a dog jumps up onto the table, well, what's a person at the table going to do? Down, Fido. Get down to the ground. Now, sometimes, though, dogs are persistent, and they beg, and they look up at you while you're sitting there eating and enjoying your meal together with your family, and their eyes just glimmer in the light, and they beg for that food, and sometimes you just can't help it but sneak them a little scrap under the table because you love your dog, and it's hard to say no to that cute little puppy. And that's kind of what was going on in the reading today. But it's not just little scraps that the dog gets to eat in that story. Because the one who has set the table, who has given every blessing in heaven and on earth and under the earth, is God himself. Is there anything that he doesn't have? Is there anything that he can't do? Whenever he sets the table, whenever he gives the meal, whenever he gives the best blessings— He gives so much that the table itself can hardly hold all that he has set before his people. And you know that if there's dogs under the table that Jesus has prepared, there is going to be an abundance of things falling down for them to eat too. And that woman in the gospel reading, she knows that. She knows that God gives every good gift, that he is generous and compassionate, that his mercies are new every morning. And so even though she might see herself as a dog just looking for scraps, she knows that God has set the table abundantly and that all of his good gifts are for her too. And that's something that I hope that you learn today as well, that God loves you very much and that because he is the giver of every good gift, you have everything you need from him. Certainly, he works through people like your parents to make sure that there's food on the table. Sometimes he works through your church to care for different things that your family might need. Uh, Certainly, to be able to hear that good news about Jesus, just like you're listening to it right now. And I pray that as your week goes along, that you keep coming to Jesus again and again and again, because he invites you and draws you to himself. Keep praying to him, trusting in him, and know that he is the giver of every good gift. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for all of the amazing gifts that you have given us in our lives, and especially, Lord, the gift of pets and dogs and family and food, all sorts of amazing things that serve as reminders in our daily lives of just how good you are and how generous you are to us. Thank you for making us part of your family, that we can know you and love you and know that we are loved by you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. For our hymn of the day, we get to sing a a wonderful hymn. It's called Just As I Am Without One Plea. It's hymn number 570, if you'd like to follow along in your hymnal. But this is a song that we sing with sincerity from our heart and from our spirit, that we know there is nothing we can do coming before our God to make him love us any more or any less. But just as we are, We come before him at his invitation, ready to praise him and pray to him. Let's sing our hymn of the day together.
one of the many, many wonderful things about our Cross family is that anytime we gather for worship, whether it's here in the sanctuary or whether we watch from our living rooms or porches or wherever, is that we get to feast upon the Word of God, to gather at His table and to be filled up with the very bread of life, Jesus Himself, as He speaks to us in the Holy Scriptures. Our reading today that is the the sermon focus for us is in Matthew chapter 15. And I invite you to listen intently again as we hear of these words, this amazing story of an interaction between Jesus and someone who trusts in him with great faith. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, A Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is God's amazing word. There was a man who was enjoying lunch that had just been set down before him on his plate as he sat at a restaurant out on an outside patio. And walking up the path and sitting down right next to him, just as his warm food had arrived, was a sweet little dog. And he could tell that this dog was hungry because of the way that the dog had postured itself right there in front of him and looked up at him with just the most pitiful eyes he had ever seen. And so he looked at the dog, and he looked at his plate, and he saw that there was a necessary connection needed between that piece of grilled chicken in front of him and that dog's mouth. And so he took his fork and knife and cut that grilled chicken breast in half, and he placed it in the dog's mouth. But but much to that man's surprise, the dog did not just scarf it all down in one big chomp. No, the dog, she held it gently in her mouth. And with a, a bit of a grin around the outside of her mouth, she turned around and walked out of that patio and started going down a path just around the block. Now, this man was just curious enough that he wanted to follow what on earth this dog was doing. Now, maybe the dog just needed some privacy to eat, who knows what this little one was up to, but, but she, he followed this dog. And he found that this dog, who had carried that chicken so gently in her mouth, was now nibbling it off into tiny bite-sized pieces to feed her little puppies just around the corner. Now, there are all sorts of stories about dogs, and some of them are heartwarming like this. And there are some other stories that if you were to hear all the details, it just tears apart your heart. Sometimes you hear stories about the way people treat dogs whenever there is just the the ungodly event of something like a school shooting or, uh, God forbid, a serial killer. And they try to find out, was there something about this person's past, uh, some red flag that we should have noticed to be able to intervene before this got so out of hand? And no matter whether it's a heartwarming or a heart-wrenching story about a dog and a person, There's often a phrase that comes into our view, and it's a phrase that serves as the sermon title for us today, because I think that it is absolutely true that you can tell something about somebody from the way a person treats a dog. Now, that truism is something that we find at work in today's gospel reading as well, because we see references to dogs all over the place in the gospel reading, an interaction between Jesus and a Canaanite woman. Now, to set the stage of how these two people had what honestly is a very unlikely meeting, you have to know where Jesus had just traveled to. 
He went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, uh, just about the only place in his whole earthly ministry where he left the region of the Jewish people out into the lands of the Gentiles. But he went out there on purpose, of course. And there he met this Canaanite woman, a Gentile, someone who was not part of the house of Israel, someone who was actually part of the peoples who had inhabited the promised land that God had instructed his people to displace so that they might have a home there. Now this Canaanite woman, she found out something about Jesus. Surely his reputation had preceded him here, that she had known that he was a great miracle worker, a great healer of people that he had powers over the heavens and over the earth, that anything, if he just said a word, it would be so. And so she has sought out this Jesus, and she finds him. And she is crying out after him. And this is what she says when she finds him. She says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, O son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. This woman, who is not an Israelite, who is not part of the same people that Jesus has come from, that the disciples have come from, she knows something about Jesus. And from the moment we meet her in this story, we see that she trusts in the Christ. O Lord, O Son of David, she knows that this man, this miracle worker, Jesus, is in fact the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world who has been sent by God up above to dwell among men. And she calls out to him desperately for help. But she's not just looking for help for herself. She's not just looking for scraps, for morsels, for for something to sustain her. No, she is a mother, and her daughter is hurting. She doesn't explain here in this passage what her daughter might have been doing, but there are other places in the Gospels where God's Word describes what someone possessed by a demon might do. There's another story of a man who has a son who's possessed by a demon who throws himself into fire. There's other places where people possessed by demons cut themselves with stones. It must have been an awful thing to see her daughter suffer in a way such as those. And so she comes to Jesus. She begs. She begs for mercy for her daughter. Now, when she comes before Jesus begging him for help, he doesn't answer her right away. In fact, Jesus is not the next person who speaks. It's actually someone else in the story who begs next. Just as the woman had begged Jesus for mercy, so now his disciples beg Jesus to send her away. And that's what they said. They said, send her away for she is crying out after us. Now, for those of you who have a heart Hearing the disciples speak that way just tugs at us. Send her away. Jesus, you could help her. What are the disciples doing here? Well, we'll get to what Jesus says next. Uh, But from the way that he answers them, it becomes clear that the disciples instructing him to send her away, they they don't intend for him to send her away empty-handed. I think probably the best way to interpret what the disciples were saying right there was, Jesus, just get the healing over with. Send her on our way. We've got bigger fish to fry. And so they tell Jesus to send her away. They beg the question, is this really what we need to be about in this moment? We've come all this way. We've got so many important things to do, Jesus. Is this really why we've come all the way here? Well, Jesus begs to differ. And he doesn't just dismiss the disciples or just dismiss the Canaanite woman. He actually says something that reframes both of these groups. And this is what he says. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if you've ever spent time listening to Jesus, this will not come as a surprise to you. Sometimes Jesus says things that are difficult to understand. What is Jesus saying here? It's a difficult thing to unpack, but Jesus is saying something that really helps us understand what he was about to do. He knows full well, just as the Canaanite woman does, and I'm sure the disciples knew as well, that this woman was not part of the house of Israel. 
She was not a sheep of that flock. And yet, and yet, she trusts in Jesus as her Savior, as the source of the gift that she needed for her daughter, as the source of all mercy for the well-being of her family. And Jesus wanted to set the stage, not only by what he said in that moment, but also by, by what he was about to do for her, for her daughter. So Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Clearly dissatisfied by what she had heard from this amazing miracle worker, she comes before him again and she says, Lord, help me. She was not about to give up. This was her chance. This was her chance as a mother who loved her daughter to care for her family. She had no power of her own to deal with the demonic possession that her daughter was enduring and suffering greatly under. But she trusted that Jesus could help. And so she begs again, Lord, help me. And she goes before him again and again, calling after him incessantly. And this woman, this desperate mother who asks for help from Jesus, hears something that I don't think any mother would ever want to hear from God. Jesus says, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. If you had been in her shoes that day, what would you think of Jesus in that very moment? Maybe you've called out to help for, from God before. Has he ever said it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? That to stare you in the face and to actually call you like a dog. But that's what happens here. And there is something amazing that happens. And only God himself could have known exactly how all of this would go to have orchestrated this with such wisdom and grace and mercy because he knew this woman's heart and he knew exactly how guided by his own spirit how she would reply to this. And so, after being called a dog, she says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I don't think however hard I might have had to dig in that moment that I would have pulled out such a great confession of faith before Jesus. And yet this woman does. She is called a dog. And in humility and in just unspeakable faith, she admits as much and owns that she is what she is. She's not part of the lost sheep of the house of Israel to which Jesus has been primarily sent in his earthly ministry. And she knows it. And in humility, she admits it before Jesus. Great faith in her, in that confession, in that confession of her, her own standing in the grand scheme of God's people. But not only is she humble, she is also hopeful because she knows that even though she may not technically have a place at the table as part of God's chosen nation in the, the redemptive narrative of history, she knows that the one who has set that table is an abundant giver of every good gift. And even if she may not be able to pull up a chair for herself, she knows that the food is set before her, the great forgiveness and grace and life everlasting that Jesus pours out abundantly upon his people, that there is enough too for her. And that if God were to set a great banquet before his own holy chosen people, that there would be enough for her as well. So she says, yes, Jesus, feed your children, for I trust that when you do, there will be enough even for me. <laughs> she understands some amazing things, and she's commended for her faith. She knows that she is not too great to need God, and she also recognized that her sin neither was too great 
for God to care for her. (laughs) And so Jesus answers her, O woman, great is your faith. May it be done for you as you desire. Her heart was set on the things of God. She knew that, that her Lord was the greatest gift in that moment and the greatest giver, the, the one who could do all things. And in faith, she had sought him out and received exactly what the Lord knew she needed, healing for her daughter. In that faithful request she brought before Jesus, she found a faithful God who faithfully answered her cry for mercy. And through a humble interaction and a hopeful interaction, she learned what God can do firsthand as he miraculously and instantaneously healed her daughter in that very moment. Jesus is the very Son of God himself. And he has done unmentionable and unimaginable, wonderful things for you and for me. And for what it's worth, you and I, before God, we are just dogs in so many ways. Now, dogs can be cute, yes, but they don't always have a place at the table. And so for us to have a place at the table of our God our God had to do something amazing. You see, for for a dog to have a place at the banquet of our Lord, well, the son had to leave his place at the table and become as a dog in our place. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us, you know. He left his seat at the throne of God, uh, the eternal pleasures of heaven, and he came down far below the heavenly banquet table to dwell among us. And he sat among us and he lived among us and he gave his life for you and for me. The very son of God gave up his place that we might have his place because of what the son of God has done for dogs like me and like you. We have a place the Son's place at the table of our God, a great blessing from the Lord and giver of life who gives abundantly beyond what we could imagine or even hope or think to ask. Our God is good, and he gives according to his mercy. I encourage you this week to be calling out to God for that mercy but to call out in humility and in hopefulness, recognizing and admitting just as the Canaanite woman did long, long ago, that you and I are not too good to need our God. And to also recognize, too, that our sin is not too great, that God cannot help us. He is truly great, and he has given you and me a place at his table because of what Jesus has done. To him be all the glory now and forever. Amen. As we continue with our worship service at this time, we get to confess our faith together. As we stand here before God right now, he hears us and he sees us and he looks upon us with eyes of love as we confess this faith in him. It's a faith that his spirit has placed within us as his people, that he has welcomed us into his family, that we are part of his own household that we have a place at the table with him. So let's confess our faith together, reciting these ancient, ancient words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, 
and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and is glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and to pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth. Grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and by all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily, and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend Delbert Tannenberger, Robert Stavanger, Doris Belke, Delania Davis, Marta Ergang, Fred and Judy Golterman, Deanne Langmire, Darlene Mahowski, Karen Miller, Lila Miller, Kathy Noakes, Matt Smith, and all who are in need, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares. And help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He teaches us, cares for us, and unites us by faith in his name. Amen. Each week we have the privilege of offering encouragement for one another as part of the Cross family. And if you are part of our cross family and are in need, and you're calling out, oh Lord, have mercy on me. If there are ways that we might be able to share in the mercy and grace of God with you, to provide from the bounty of his table in your time of need, please let us know. And if you'd like to be able to participate in helping others in that way, let us know too. And we'll do our best to connect you with an opportunity to share from those good and gracious gifts from our good and gracious God, that he might continue to grow and expand and enlarge his kingdom, even through us. As we continue with our worship now, we pray the way that our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray. And we ask, Lord, that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully incline your ears to us, who have now made our prayers and supplications to you, and grant that those things which we have faithfully asked according to your will, we may receive to meet our need and to bring glory to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive now abundant blessings from our God through the words of the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. For our closing hymn today, we get to join our voices with the voices of countless others around the world and throughout time and place, those who have followed Jesus and called upon his name in prayer and in praise. And so now we sing our closing hymn together. We're so thankful that you have been part of our Cross family, worshiping together today, feasting upon the Word of God, and enjoying the gifts that God gives us through His amazing good news in Jesus. Certainly, I encourage you, if you have a family pet, especially a dog, or cats are okay too, or even a hamster or a goldfish, send in a picture of your family pet. Let us know how much you love them as part of your home's uh, joys in this life as a gift from God. And certainly, if there's anything that we can do to be praying for you or getting to know you better or helping you become part of our Cross family, please give us a call or comment or direct message or however you can reach us. We'd be glad to have that conversation with you. Until we meet again, always know that God loves you, your pastors love you, your Cross family loves you, and God is always, always with you. May he be praised and glorified in your life until we meet again.